Rabbi and Rabbi Eric Walker, and excited to share with you the reissue, the second edition of the Codist is now available. We won the battle, we got the rights back from the publisher, and now it's out on Amazon. You can get it in both Kindle and paperback. I know you're happy to hear that because this is the most diabolical plot Satan has ever created, the weaponization of DNA to wipe out the Levites, the Levitical line, and therefore thwart the return of our Messiah. Also, you can go to our webpage, ignitingnation.com, scroll down the bottom of the page, put in your email address, and get the first chapter of the new book, The Seven Laws of Abundant Living, Lessons Learned from the Tree of Life, taking you on a journey from the ground all the way out to the fruit and understanding why God used the things of the natural to reveal the supernatural. I had the pleasure this morning of visiting with our good friend, Dr. Michael Heiser, and today we're going to be talking about his book, Reversing Herman, Enoch, The Watchers, and the Forgotten Mission of Jesus Christ. Dr. Michael Heiser is a graduate of the University of Pennsylvania with a Master's of Arts in Ancient History, the University of Wisconsin-Madison with a Master's of Arts, a Ph.D. in Hebrew Bible and Semitic Studies. He has a dozen years of classroom teaching experience on the college level and another ten in distance education. He's currently a scholar and a residence at Logos Bible Software, a company that produces ancient text databases and other digital resources for study of the ancient world and biblical studies. Website listings of all his books and more information can be found at httpdrmsh.com. And we're very pleased to announce that Dr. Heiser will be joining us every month on the third Monday of each month at 12 o'clock p.m. Central Time, beginning in the month of March. Michael Heiser, welcome back to Revealing the Truth. Yeah, thank you for having me again. Uh, one of the reasons I wanted to, to really delve into uh, this book, Reversing Herman, and you actually make the statement uh, very Uh-oh. clear. <laughs> I, uh, you say this book is about the important influence that the story of the sin of the watchers in First Enoch 6.16 had on the thinking of New Testament writers. You also say that this is something we do not talk about in the church. Uh, to be honest with you, we don't talk about much in the church anymore except for salvation. <laughs> right. uh, yeah, you got me there. <laughs> uh, so when we get into this, this area of uh, depth into understanding sin, the arbiters of sin, the harbingers of sin, what sin's role is in God's economy, why did he introduce it into the world, why did he allow it to exist, and how does this play out in everyday life is a complex issue if you go down the study of demonology, angelology, uh, the role of everything from uh, Genesis 6 going forward, you encounter all of this and most people kind of blow it off because it requires a certain complex study. But you've done that in reversing Herman. Uh, kind of take me through your thinking when you were assembling this work. And this is a compilation work. And I want to make sure that, that it's presented that way because that's how you presented it. What you did was you took and you compiled many different sources into one defender piece that I could make sense of without having to do the PhD research that you did. So yeah, so- that, that that's always the goal. Um, my my, if I have a thing, it's taking a high level peer reviewed scholarship and making it decipherable to people who care. Uh, you don't have to go out and get degrees and you know have access to this or that and. I mean, I, again, I, I view that sort of as my role. And so when, when I was, you know, I was asked by the, the publisher, hey, you know, we'd, we'd like to do a book with you, you know, put some thought into it. Um, you know, I, I thought, you know, Enoch, something you know, about Enoch would be, you know, pretty good. You know, that would be the sweet spot. And I was just kind of, uh, 
you know, it was through my dissertation and writing Unseen Realm that, you know, I kept running into Enochian material and there's Enochian material in Unseen Realm and, and my dissertation for that matter. And I, I've more or less just collected this stuff. And when Defender asked me this question and I went and looked, I was really kind of amazed that nobody uh, in the academic community, in, in the scholarly community, that you know, everybody's publishing articles on on how Enoch connects with New Testament stuff. Uh, you, you go to the academic conferences and they're doing papers on it, but nobody had collected it and basically presented it in one book, which I thought somebody surely would have done that at some point, but they hadn't. And so I thought, okay, I, I got the idea now. And so reversing Hermon is. A, a both a collection and a if you want pardon the, the term a translation right. of high scholarship of the you know the Mesopotamian it begins with the Mesopotamian background to the Enoch story which is also the background to the Old Testament you know Genesis 6 1 through 4 really 1 through 5 uh, story so we start from there and then we you know spend a couple chapters just laying all that out and talking about how the Jewish community in the intertestamental period inherited, you know, both the knowledge of the background of Genesis 6 and, you know, what the Enochian material was doing, what they were drawing on. They, that, that was very familiar to people who lived during the intertestamental period, which, which includes the, you know, eventually the apostles, the writers of the New Testament. And so... You know, from that point on, after doing a couple chapters that it's like, where does this story, where does this backdrop leak into the New Testament? In other words, if you had this floating around in your head uh, and you had, you know, a knowledge of the Old Testament, you know, background, the Genesis 6 and, and the Mesopotamian background to that. And then you had read books like Enoch or Jubilees or whatever. Right. In the intertestamental period, if you had this floating around in your head, what would you see in the New Testament that would just sort of, you know, be a red flag that would just, you know, alert you to, OK, we have a point of connection here between what Paul's saying or what Peter's saying or what's happening in the Gospels. We have a connection back to this this story. You know, there's a breadcrumb trail here that that would would have been easy for them to to see because they had they had this stuff in their head they were reading these works and so i thought this would be a great book just to help us become more alert readers of our new testament because the biblical writers had read this material uh it was meaningful to them they it it, it influenced their thinking in certain respects they dropped breadcrumbs from that material in their own writings but we just sort of run our eyes right over it because we're taught not to read this stuff. And, and so we just we miss these things that they lay out, arguments that they make using this material for various theological points. It, you know, we, we just miss it completely because we don't have our senses attuned to any of it. But the academic community does. They're all over this. So I thought, hey, this is a great idea. We're going to collect this, try to present it in a way that, you know, people can pick up on and follow, and they'll just be better New Testament readers for it. The concept of evil coming into the world, us looking at the fall in the garden, mm -hmm. Satan usurps the authority of man. Man was designated as the prince of this earth or the, the, the one with dominion over this earth and because of uh, the sin and the fall of man, uh, Satan's now become the prince of this earth. Um, we tend to forget that he was already here. Uh, <laughs> we read all throughout the Bible about the fall. We're just never told exactly when. Uh, I guess the closest thing we have is Luke ten eighteen, where Jesus says, "I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven," and then he goes on to give that dominion and authority back to us as followers of the Messiah. Uh, but that's a that's a flash. That's an instant. Uh, that doesn't support a gap 
theory, uh, maybe it was between Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-2 that this lightning bolt uh, brings about the fall of Satan. We don't have, we have speculation, but no clear definitive date setting within the scripture. Uh, but then we begin to look at a prophecy in Genesis 3.15, which becomes the foundational prophecy of the entirety of scripture. That there is this, this enmity that exists between good and evil, between the seed of the woman, Jesus, and the seed of the serpent, the Antichrist, or the return of the capital S, Satan. Um, and what we preach in the pulpit is salvation, 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 salvation. It's all about Jesus. But, uh, and emulating a life of a reflection of the Messiah. But we're battling against not against flesh and blood, uh, but our battle is against the principalities and, and the spiritual things, and we don't delve deeply into the battle plan. We just throw on our suit of armor and walk out the house and walk down the middle of the street and get hit by a bus, and we wonder, gee, wonder why that happened, and that bus happens to have a name. And it happens to have an origin, and it happens to have an assembly line, and a place that it was it was designed, it was built, and it made it onto the road. And that's exactly what you're doing in this book, is explaining to us how this bus that is designed not to carry us and transport us from place to place, but it's designed to run us over. Yeah, I, I like to put it this way, you know, I'm... Again, I'm, I'm used to people looking at me like I got two heads, so I don't really mind anymore. <laughs> um, but, you know, if you ask the average Christian, hey, why is the world the way it is? Why is it such a mess? You're going to get, oh, that's the fall. Well, okay. If you ask the average, you know, first century Jew or the, the Israelite, hey, why is the world so messed up? Why is it the way it is? That's not the answer you would get. The fall would be the first of three, you know, explanations for why the world is the way it is. You know, we have the fall. The second number two would be the, the, the incident in Genesis 6. Right. And then the third would be the, the judgment of the nations at Babel, you know, disinheriting them and God assigning them to lesser divine beings who become corrupt. And then we get Psalm 82 and Isaiah 34 and all these passages. You know, the, this, this adversarial relationship between Yahweh and his inheritance, his people, his land, really, and everybody else. So that, you know, you, you get this three-pronged answer. And, and the problem is, in most churches, we, we embrace the first one. But the other two, we demythologize. We, we pretend that, that they don't really say what they say. We pretend that... You know, we, 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 we sort of call out the hermeneutical SWAT team to strip the supernatural out of these passages. And, and when you do that, the effect of that is you, you can't think in cosmic terms about the situation, not only that you're in if you're a lost person, but you can't think in cosmic terms about the situation that the church is in and, and what the Great Commission is really opposed by. And, you know, the, the, the supernatural worldview to all this that extends beyond the fact that we're estranged from God and we're going to die, that, that's the effect of the fall. Right. Uh, it, it, the, the problem is a whole lot bigger than that. You know, Second Temple Jews, again, intertestamental Jews, traced really the roots of depravity, not so much in the fall. I mean, they, they recognize that here we have the entrance of evil into the world and, and we have to own, you know, our sin and all that. But they looked at Genesis 6 uh, as we were, we are victims of greater intelligences that have put certain things at our disposal, given us, you know, taught humanity certain things and manipulate humanity in their knowledge of those things to basically destroy ourselves and to turn our hearts toward idolatry. This is a constant theme in the, in the Second Temple literature. It gets laid at the feet 
of the Watchers, you know, Genesis 6, the Sons of God, they are blamed specifically with not introducing human depravity or human sin, but accelerating it and making it just much worse. You know, giving us the all we need to destroy ourselves and turn us away, you know, toward idolatry. And then the third, of course, we have the whole idolatrous situation with the nations. But, you know, that factors into Daniel, you know, when you get, yeah, you, Daniel talks a lot about empires, of course, but behind those empires are greater intelligences, you know, the princes of the various nations. And if you don't, if you don't think in those terms, you're, you're naturally going to think the solution to these things is government or our own wisdom, you know, our own abilities. And it, it never sort of takes on a spiritual character that what we're really up against and what we really have to guard against is a battle for our mind, not not at the level of the public school, even though that's a factor, obviously, our, you know, our education system, right. but a battle for our minds that is, you know, we, we have adversaries that are much more intelligent than we are. And I, I view spiritual warfare in those terms. And, and I like to think of it as um, how would, it, how would a, a, a tremendously intelligent being that is fully conversant with human nature, how would they move herds? Okay, it's really about ideas. It's about changing thinking. It's about turning hearts, to use a biblical metaphor, um, away from truth, away from thinking about who God really is, that he loves humanity, turning him into a killjoy or an enemy, uh, manipulating our own desires so that we can't take the long look about anything we're doing to ourselves. Uh, you know, we, it, it, it's really about changing thinking. Uh, in, in a way that, that becomes idolatrous and self-destructive. And that, that's basically what we have uh, in the world. And, uh, and all that goes back through Daniel, through Deuteronomy 32.8, all the way back to Genesis 6. You know, it, it, the Second Temple literature, they, they just thought in very grand cosmic terms because they believed that there were superior intelligences that were their enemies. And that they they affected behavior and thinking, and they did things like start wars and warfare, and, you know, even you know idol things that get accrued to idolatry. Idolatry is not just bowing down to an image, but it can be drugs. You know, pharmakeia in the New Testament was intimately associated with idolatry, you know, the, which of course affects the mind and, and whatnot. I mean, any images, any number of ways that. You can alter a person's thinking about themselves, about God, about what God wants, about who God is, about salvation, your need for salvation, the great commitment, any number of things. That That's really you know what we're up against. And, and if I were having this conversation with a Second Temple Jew, he'd probably be yawning at this point because this is like 101 theology. Right. But in our churches, we, we are sort of reflexively taught to not think past our estrangement from God and the need to recognize Jesus as Savior, which obviously is crucial. But then, you know, we, we tend to look, you know, at, at other things uh, when, when we talk about what's the duty of the church. You know, we, we pass off a lot of the duty of the church to, to government. You know, for instance, I, I don't want to get on the hobby horse here, but, you know, there the way we look at our mission has dramatically changed. And and now we are fully willing to let somebody else love our neighbor. You know, the, the, the people we pay taxes to, they're the ones who are supposed to love our neighbor for us. Um, you know, we redefine the gospel into making us feel better, you know, participation trophy kind of mentality. Uh, it, it's really kind of insidious uh, when, when you kind of think about it. You know, the way our these fundamental ideas have been altered uh, in the church. And a lot of it goes back to stripping a supernatural worldview out of our theology, which, can't, which sounds really strange, but that's essentially what we've done. You know, when we, uh, when we treat the worldview of the biblical writers as though it's not something we can assign any reality to. Well, then we throw in, and as a Jew, I can I can say this to you: it's almost uh, a buy one get one free. Today, if you accept Jesus as your Messiah, 
you will receive eternal life, but wait, there's more. If you accept Jesus today, you can get out of the coming tribulation, the coming trouble. And that's kind of a, uh, a you know, a dual salvation kind of, of marketing strategy that seems to have permeated a lot of denominational Christianity, <clears throat> that it's not enough that that your sins were taken away. And you being a <clears throat> semantics person, and I'm not anti-semantic, uh, uh, <laughs> uh, understand that statement that, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world is a direct reference back to the Day of Atonement, to the laying on of the hands, onto the goat, and the sin is taken away. It's the only time in the Old Testament that sin is taken away. All other times it's covered. So <clears throat> when my ears hear the word take away, I'm really going to hone in on that because I only know it as an annual event, and after the destruction of the Second Temple, there was no place. So I have to begin to explore how do I get my sins taken away if I've lost this very important event, <clears throat> and it's not about repairing the world. Well, when I began <clears throat> my investigation as a new believer 22 years ago, and I read the New Testament, I'm seeing evil incarnate. I'm seeing these, these influences, and I see Paul trying to do to, to everything he can to be a gentleman, scholar, uh, apostle, but to tell them that what they're up against is they're up against this creeping influence of, of a power and an authority that has dominion and has an existence and a presence in this present world. It is in the present day and time, and we are up against it, and we have changed its name. We have changed its appearance. We've now made it normal, and uh, actually it, it, it's become the whole heartbeat of uh, uh, this identity movement, as I can identify myself as anything I want, that is such a demonic uh, uh, concept uh, steeped in what the message of these watchers, the message of uh, <laughs> the fallen ones, uh, the, the message of the five I wills of Isaiah, um, I can ascend to the throne of heaven. I can now become a god. I can now become whatever I want. And we've perpetuated it to the point where we are uh, promoting an agenda that we were warned about. And the warning came as you're going to hear about a Jesus that's, in, and, and in the Greek it's, it's, uh, uh, it says it, it's different, but it's not wholly different. It's kind of similar. You're going to have a Holy Spirit which is wholly different and a gospel which is wholly different. But the Jesus is going to be different but similar to the Jesus of the Bible. And we have hundreds of thousands and millions of people going to church every Sunday, and they're hearing about this Jesus that's kind of like the Jesus of the Bible, but we've toned him down to be the prosperity Jesus. And a gospel which is not the gospel at all, and a Holy Spirit that is not the Holy Spirit that... I came to understand as, as um, uh, this power, this force, this, this, this exact thing that the Pharisees, the Sadducees, uh, the Sanhedrin was condemned in the book of Luke for blaspheming the Holy Spirit, that this was the violation of the third commandment that had a punishment connected to it. I've spoken to people that say to them, what's the third commandment? Thou shalt not take the Lord's name in vain. I say, what's the rest of it? It says, or you shall not be found guiltless. Oh, I never heard that before. Well, there was no New Testament at the time that Jesus was saying these words. He was judging them by their own law and condemning them under their own law, saying that you can say what you want about me, I'm just a guy. But you blaspheme, you speak against the Holy Spirit. 
that what I'm doing is not in the power and the anointing, the very spirit that spoke the world into existence, the very spirit that, that took dust of the earth and breathed the life and soul, nephesh, into man. You're, you're taking on the God of heaven, the capital E, Elohim. All right, and you're starting to follow the little small E Elohims that man has been weaving and following along all this way, which is why this is such a spectacular book. We're going to take a short break, and when we come back, I want to dig in to some more of the text, and we will probably continue this dialogue when we meet again next time because this is so complex. And it's been so watered down that it doesn't even represent a percentage of the teaching of the 2.5 billion self-identified believers of Jesus as the Messiah in the world today. There are concepts contained in here and in the scriptures that are not discussed, not at seminary, not in the pulpit, and certainly there's a few of us that are willing to take this on, and you're right, they do look at us like we have a couple of heads. But you know what? I would rather be biblically correct, God correct, than be accepted by man if the text will support and the text does support the position that you and I take. We're going to take a short break. We'll be right back with Dr. Michael Heiser talking about reversing Hermon, Enoch, the Watchers, and the Forgotten Mission of Jesus Christ. Shalom. I'm the Reverend Rabbi Eric Walker, Executive Director of Ignatica Nation and host of the daily TV program Revealing the Truth, seen live every Monday through Friday from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. Central Standard Time at www.ianbn.com and then replayed throughout the day and night via our website. All of our segments can be seen on the Ignatica Nation YouTube channel. Since our launch in January of this year, we've expanded our global reach to over 54 countries with a social media following of over 125,000. Our commitment is to bring you the most in-depth interviews with authors, subject matter experts, and thought leaders from around the world. We have interviewed guests from Israel, Brazil, England, India, and all across North America. All of our authors are featured on the books and media page on our website, www.ianbn.com. There you can find a direct link to the book you want to order, and we receive a small commission directly from Amazon. There is no cost to you for this service. In addition to our daily teachings and interviews, we make available to you the archive of all of the interviews on our YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram channels. Our live program is available from our homepage and there is never a charge to you for any of this access. We made the decision long ago that we would remain a commercial free resource that would not be influenced by any pressure from any outside company. There are only two ways that we are able to continue to operate this ministry and provide you with the only live four hour daily Christian television talk show program. The first is through your support and tax deductible contributions to Igniting a Nation. These can be made directly through the button on the website or sent through the mail to Igniting a Nation, 2700 Corporate Drive, Suite 120, Birmingham, Alabama, 35242. The other way we support the program is by offering you a unique opportunity to have access to over 10 years worth of teachings on a subscription basis. The teaching archives contains all of my prior sermons, Torah studies, Prophecy in the News videos, and much more for the low subscription price of $5 per month. This subscription grants you unlimited access to over 800 hours of content not available elsewhere and is updated weekly with the most current prophecy classes. In addition to 20 hours of original TV programming each weekday, we invite you to join us live every Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday evenings for our Prophecy in the News classes. The times and locations are listed on our events page on the website www.ianbn.com. Every day you and I are faced with the challenge of where we will go of its kind that covers the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. We cannot do this without your support. 
Since we launched on January 5th, 2017, we have aired over 300 individual teachings, interviews, and commentaries not available anywhere else. We are now working side by side with almost every major Christian publishing house to bring you the most in-depth feature interviews possible. Our one-hour features address every subject that affects the believer's life. We are hearing of salvations from the Middle East, Africa, and all across the United States. Lives are being changed every day, and we have only just begun. Our mission is to become your trusted resource and grant you access to the people, tools, and information you need to grow in your relationship with the Lord. You can help us by liking us on social media and through your financial support. We know you have many choices in who you support, but we are prayerfully asking you to consider helping us keep revealing the truth, true to our calling, to cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth like no other program available. Donate today and help us bring the message to the four corners of the earth. Visit www.ianbn.com and donate, buy a book, or subscribe to Teaching Archives. Without you, we do not exist. Shalom and welcome back to this edition of Revealing the Truth, where we cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. I'm your host, the Reverend Rabbi Eric Walker. We're talking with Dr. Michael Heiser about his new book, Reversing Hermon. We, we have this, this kind of dual salvation theology that's going on, this buy one, get one free, accept Jesus and get out of the coming trouble, uh, rapture mentality, and people just think this mark of the beast uh, is just some metaphorical or maybe it's mythological or maybe it's part of this, this um, uh, unconscious, superconscious state of this vision. But the vision given to John at Patmos was a Jewish vision to a Jewish man. And the reference to the mark of the beast takes us back, it harkens us back to the beginning all the way back in Genesis, when Cain slays Abel, Cain cries out to God and says, if you send me out there, they're going to kill me. He said, hey, don't worry about it. I'm going to mark you. Okay? That word mark there, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, is also the same Hebrew word used for marking the doorpost of the house. Uh, it is a visible, external, not an embedded chip, it is something that can be seen, recognized, and identified. And we see the reference to what we would call the gematria, uh, the numerology, the number of his name, knowing that it was 666, which means that every Hebrew letter has a value, and we would be looking at a Hebrew name that was assigned to this. And <clears throat> it's like it's mythology. It's like it's something that nobody has to deal with because nobody's going to be around when that happens. And if anybody's around, it's me, the Jews, and we'll finally get what we have coming to us because we rejected Jesus. People don't even understand the concept of what happened the day that the Jews, Israel, laid their hands on Jesus and Rome laid their hands on Jesus. It takes you all the way back to the Day of Atonement and where the priest transferred the sin, now the sin of the nations are on the back of the Messiah. He's no longer without blemish or spot. He has to be taken outside the city to be crucified because he's no longer clean. He's taken to the place where the entrails, the offal, the bowels, the place Golgotha, which was the dump. That's where he was crucified. He could not be the pure Paschal lamb anymore. He bore the sin of the world. And when you talk to people about things like this and say this is the reality of the Jewishness, the Hebrew concept, the entirety, it doesn't matter what language it was written in, these are Jewish first century and prior Jewish concepts that are being played out and it's ignored as if it is pure mythology. Help me here. Yeah, we, we, were, we were talking about, um, just in the way that you began here, 
you know, you're I'm trying you're two for the price of one metaphor here. <laughs> what what's really disturbing about that is if you present the gospel that way, and then your eschatological, your end time system doesn't pan out the way you were told it would pan out, since you've married it to the gospel, it would be very easy for people to just, you know, have their faith destroyed. You know, you you you, you bought into this, if I can be, you know, kind of flippant here, but you bought into this because, you know, you wanted to escape this wrath to come and, you know, we're living in the last days and blah, 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 blah. And so you, you, you've you mentally married that to the gospel. And then all of a sudden, if that isn't the way things pan out, what do you think of the gospel? That must have been just nonsense. You know, it, it can really be, you know, faith destroying at that point, which, again, I, end times is probably one of my least uh, favorite things, you know, to, to get into and talk about because I think all the systems cheat and they all have problems. But in this case, if this one turns out to be flawed and wrong, it can be soul crushing. It can be faith destroying because of, the, of just exactly what you said, the way things are presented. It's not just, you know, you have your sins forgiven and eternal life, but now it's married to this escape route from something that, you know, that could happen in real time in your life. And again, if that's the way the gospel is presented to you, it really becomes uh, a, a potentially um, faith-destroying thing uh, if, if it just doesn't pan out that way. Uh, it, it, so I, I would just caution people, do not present the gospel. Don't marry the gospel to right. an end-time scheme. And, 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 I, and I completely agree with you. Um, sin is in the world, and it is... It, it morphs. It morphs into characters, shapes, forms, uh, temptations. There's the, it, it takes on so many forms that it is an infinite challenge because it is God-ordained. And because and it is empowered the way it is empowered, the foundational message of Genesis, everybody calls Genesis the book of creation. The story of creation. It's a story of separation. Everything that was established within the creation in the six days of creation has been separated. Every single part of it has been separated. And we now have a duology uh, or duality. Uh, people talk about the Trinity. Let me talk to you about the duality. Good and evil, heaven and hell, hev he you know, uh, heaven and earth. Uh, the water and the shore, man from woman, man from God. It's, 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 set, it's, it's all this separation, and we don't even understand our own condition, and then we're trying to take on this evil. And then someone will say, well, the battleground's the mind. No, the battleground's not the mind. The battleground is against these principalities that are being ruled by one who was the arch cherubim, and uh, oh, oh, covering, oh, morning star, oh, covering angel. Uh, he, he's called by name. Uh, Ezekiel 28. We're given a, a a wonderful view of of his power, dominion, authority, and presence on earth in this mineral garden. And I've never once heard that talked about in the church uh, about this this whole uh, prince of Tyre. Why doesn't ever call him the king? Because uh, he's talking about Satan. He's not talking about the guy sitting on the throne that's in this role. He's talking about Satan. And so uh, understanding what happened in this fall of the angelic host, of the heavenly host, which was all an army. But imagine one-third of your trained, empowered, skilled, anointed army peeling off and launching a rebellion and doing it on turf okay not yeah, we, in the heavenly realm but but actually on turf and in the heavenly realm yeah one of the one of the things i i hope to do in the book um you know is take 
again, back back to our the earlier time we had together. Again, it, what I'm trying to do in the book is if you have this story, uh, not not the fall story in this case, which I talk a lot about in Unseen Realm, but the Genesis 6 story. Right. If you have this in your head, then, you know, what, what does it inform in terms of, of your New Testament? I'll, I'll, I'll just give, you know, some real, I'll give some examples. Obviously, we can't drill down too far. But maybe in future times together, we can drill down. But there are circumstances about the genealogy of Jesus. There are circumstances about the timing of the birth of Jesus that and I, I, know, I realize this sounds very odd again to a lot of people, but there, those two things, genealogy and birth, actually have points of connection back to the Genesis 6 episode. And before listeners say, well, Mike, that's crazy talk. Okay, that, that crazy talk is based upon someone's dissertation of a few years ago at Marquette and someone else's journal article, actually a, 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 an essay in a book that teaches at Johns Hopkins. Okay, I do not do my research on Billy Bob's website on the Internet. Right. I do peer-reviewed research for these kinds of things, text-based stuff. I, I want text-driven theology and try to make it decipherable. But as, again, to us, it sounds weird. To us, it's like, no way. But to people living in the intertestamental period, they would have read these things and certain things would have just stood out. They would have been outliers. They would have been, again, these little flags. You know, pay attention to me over here. You're supposed to look at me and then think this thought. Okay, th th this is how the New Testament, it's not how the Bible is put together. And the New Testament writers are assuming a familiarity with the story, in, in the case of reversing Hermon, with Genesis 6. They're assuming a familiarity with the, with the material so that they can drop these little things in what they're writing. They want you to notice them, to take your mind back to not just a story in Genesis 6 or Enoch's version of the story. They want you to be thinking of concepts. They want you to be thinking about good versus evil. They want you to be thinking about why is the world depraved? Because if, if you're assigning the way the world is to a divine rebellion in the garden, Genesis 3, another divine rebellion in Genesis 6 before the flood, and then the, the disinheritance of the nations to other sons of God, and then they, they rebel, Psalm 82, okay? If, if this is your world, the way you think about the world, how do you think about the solution? You're going to be thinking, okay, if, th if these are the three reasons why the world is so chaotic and messed up and why, I, why I'm you know, struggling here, then surely the Messiah is going to fix not just the Genesis 3 problem. The Messiah is supposed to be the antidote to all of these problems. And so if you're thinking of that and you start reading in the Gospels and you pick up genealogy points, you pick up birth timing stuff. You pick up where Jesus goes. He goes into Gentile territory, uh, you know, and, and that's where he confronts Legion. It's a, there's a reason why it's important where he's standing when that confrontation happens and what Legion says to him that's different than other demons say to Jesus when they're encountered in Jewish territory. There's actually a difference there. And the difference matters, you know, for, for the way, you know, we're supposed to, the way the writer intended us to read that material. Jesus goes to Bashan, okay, Caesarea Philippi, the foot of Mount Hermon. He goes up into Mount Hermon, where the washers, you know, uh, you know came down from to, to, to do what they're doing, you know, back in, in the pre-flood days. Jesus goes to that place as well, and that's where the transfiguration happens. Why, I mean, couldn't have Jesus just gone anywhere? You know, pick a different mountain, pick a plain, pick a valley. You know, I mean, why do certain events happen in certain places? And why are certain things said in those places when Jesus confronts supernatural powers? Well, the answer to that is Genesis 6, in many cases, 
the the incident at Babel, and yeah, sure, Genesis three, you know, the the serpent, you know, issue that. All three of those are in view. The Messiah is the antidote to all three. But when we strip out two of those three, we, do, we, we not only can't read the New Testament as the writer intended us to read it, but we, we lose a little bit of the sense, I'd say we lose a lot of the sense of the struggle, what the, what, what the church and the Great Commission is really up against, why you know, we, we have the, the earthly conditions that we have. You know, if, if, if your explanation of those things is only human, then your answer to those things is going to be only human. And that is not the way the New Testament telegraphs these things to you. These things have a supernatural flavor. They are permeated with a, a supernatural worldview and reality. And so... For us to think strategically about our own walk, the, the, the task of the church at large, again, in the Great Commission, uh, Paul's you know, notion you know, that we kind of look at, and some people chuckle, you know, principalities and power, you know, whatever, Paul. Okay, you know, when, when, we're, when we're prone to do that, we are going, I just put it this way, I'll just be blunt, we're going to be weak. Okay, we are just going to be weak. We're going to be misguided. We're going to be doing half the job, half the way it could be done. It makes us vulnerable, and it really minimizes our impact as the people of God. And and again, that that's why we should care about getting the full picture of what's going on in the New Testament. And in, in this particular book, I try to draw our attention not to the fall, Genesis 3, not necessarily to, you know, the Deuteronomy 32.8 situation, the Babel situation, but I try to draw it to the Genesis 6 stuff because that is a neglected area. Right. And it's, and it's, it's honestly, it's intentionally neglected. You know, when we talk about <clears throat> Enoch, uh, going back to Genesis 5.29, with the ten names from Adam all the way through uh, to Noah. When we translate those names, there's actually a message uh, connecting those names uh, when we translate them into English. Uh, I'm, I, I, I don't know if you've seen this or you... I, I thought you were going to say, you draw attention to the fact that Enoch is number seven. No, no, uh, but, but... He lives but, 365 years. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, you get there, there, there's real significance. To these numbers, yes. and if, if there's a if there's a Babylonian background, there's real significance to, as to who Enoch's counterpart is. You know, in the Babylonian king, you know, all that kind of stuff. So I thought that's where you were. Going. No, actually, I was going to go to from Adam to Noah, to Noah. The translation of the words are: "Man is appointed mortal sorrow, but the blessed God shall come down, teaching that his death will bring those in despair." comfort or rest. So when you string those ten names together and translate them and you put you put in our prepositions, you put in our our and make it a sentence, it actually is the gospel message hidden in those ten names and putting them in the order that they're given to us that lays the foundation for God coming down, dying, and his death bringing those in despair comfort, which allows us to preach the gospel directly out of Genesis in two very specific places, the seed of the woman and now Genesis 5.29. Uh, the fact that um, Enoch uh, uh, plays such an important part in this uh, and this, this spiritual realm that uh, the unseen realm uh, as I told you when I interviewed you last time, I read it twice. I was just, I, I was, for, the first time was, I can't believe there's somebody else in the world that thinks like I do. Then the second second time was, is now he thinks way, way past where I think, but he's touched on these key subjects and he's connected them in such a way that I can find a single source. You've done the exact same thing um, and I'm starting to think it might be your style, is that you are a compiler of not disparate 
documentation, but coherent documentation that when connected with the proper linkage begins to give us a portrait of what God has been trying to tell us all along that we have allowed uh, scholarly pursuits to obtain MDivs and, and doctors of divinity so we can move into the pastorate vocationally has removed us from moving into this area which is a calling and this educational pursuit or this informational pursuit says I now have a tool to go deeper into the text that I've held in my hand for years that I've just read it as words on a page but I have nothing to connect it and to connect the dots and that I think my yeah. friend is your greatest skill is connecting the dots and making a cohesive portrait of something that when we look at that connect the dots you know, most people can say, oh, yeah, well, that's going to be an elephant. Uh, that's going to be a donkey. That's going to be a picture of Jesus. In your case, this is going to be a picture of the truth. And you, until you connect that last dot, you're not going to see the fullness of this picture. And so I thank you, Dr. Michael Heiser. We've run out of time. Uh, honestly, you're one of my favorite playmates. And uh, I look f forward to having you back on the program on the third Monday of each month at 12 o'clock. Once again, Dr. Michael Heiser, author of Reversing Hermon, Enoch, The Watchers, and The Forgotten Mission of Jesus Christ. Thank you so much for being a part of Revealing the Truth. Thank you. God bless. <clears throat> and that brings an end to our live broadcast day, but that doesn't bring an end to our programming. We run these programs 24 hours a day, seven days a week. This episode and the prior three will be available for replay all day long until we're back here in the studio tomorrow morning live at 9 o'clock a.m. Central Time. Until we see you back here, find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, YouTube, WNDTV, and anywhere there's a web, you'll find us revealing the truth from Igniting a Nation. Until we see you tomorrow, Shalom.